everybody. Um, this is actually, I'm really looking forward to tonight. Um, there is a nice, we were just saying, synergy for those of you who attended Melanie Perron's talk last week. Um, you're going to uh, improve your technical, uh, technological expertise even more this week. Um, and uh, so for me, it's a great pleasure to welcome Jennifer Garçon tonight. Um, Jennifer is relatively new colleague of mine here at Penn, and I can definitely say that she's made a remarkable impact in a very short time. Um, I, I have to talk a little bit because the very, very modest and humble bio that you read on the email uh, really doesn't give you enough of a sense of the range of work that Jennifer is doing and has done. So um, really, Every day I kind of learn about another hat that she wears um, or has worn, and I just want to tell you a bit more about that. So Jennifer actually received her PhD in history from the University of Miami, and her dissertation is entitled Resistant Press in the Age of Jean-Claude Duvalier, 1971 to 1986. I think some Haiti will come up tonight in the presentation. Her dissertation is a study of, to, to quote her quickly, the resurgence of independent and increasingly oppositional Haitian print and radio media after 1971. So she could have given a material text talk on just that topic. Uh, in it, she examines newspapers, weekly journals, radio broadcasts, and other media. Before that, Jennifer studied English and American literature at Brown and at Hunter College. So another hat that Jennifer wears is in the museum world. She served as collections development specialist and assistant curator at the permanent exhibit at History Miami Museum. And she worked and I think still works with the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture's Hometown Treasures Program. Um, so Jen arrived in 2018 as in the, here at Penn as something called a Bollinger Fellow in Public and Community Data Curation. That was a brand new thing and she basically had to invent it. Um, the role involved some pioneering work in shaping sustainable models for the care of vulnerable collections of data. Now, some of you might remember the data refuge back in the days of that former president to be to remain unnamed. Um, Jen participated in that data refuge project along with other colleagues I can see on my screen here. Um, and in data initiatives aimed at the identification and long-term preservation of environmental and climate data published by local, state, and federal governments. She also began the Archives for Black Lives in Philadelphia project that we're going to hear more about tonight. Now, Jennifer is the Digital Scholarship Librarian at Penn Libraries. And among her many jobs is she is currently leading a task force on the futures of digital publishing and scholarship in the library ecosystem. Uh, so she has been thinking quite a great deal about a realm that concerns all of us here tonight. Uh, and tonight, Jen's hat or her title is Data Humanism case studies in community archiving. Jennifer, it's great to have you. Over to you. Awesome, thank you so much, um, John. Um, and thank you guys all for being here. There's a lot of people here, which makes me a little nervous. Um, but I am I really appreciate the opportunity to, to um, talk to you guys tonight about um, some of the work that I've been doing at Penn, um, some of the prior work that I've been engaged in, um, and some of the the, the hard questions that I've been trying to tackle um, both personally and professionally. Um, and so I will share my screen. Um, and so I believe you all should be seeing that, yes? Okay, wonderful. Um, and so John, thank you for introducing me you did such an amazing job that some of this is actually going to seem repetitive but um i think as a form of contextualization for what i'll be talking about today it's important i think for me to um, start this way um and so introducing myself fully again um and i'm doing this in part because 
I think it'll make clear some of my various positionalities um, that drive my perspective on um, equity and archival practice. Um, and I hope that it'll make help make sense of kind of the various tangents I'm about to take you guys on. Um, but eventually I will get to my point, um, which is in short that building an empathetic and truly representative cultural um, record requires facilitating cross-cultural dialogue outside of institutional walls and silos. Um, and that it necessitates being critical about how and why our current institu institutional practices are at odds with our expressed intentions about inclusivity. Um, and so oh, all of what John said, I think is spot on uh, with the exception of the fact that I am a member of the archives for Black Lives Matter in Philadelphia, an organizing member. Um, it was started before I got here, but I've had the pleasure of working with them um, and they are fantastic colleagues and friends. Um, but yeah, I'm the digital scholarship librarian at Penn um, and I have for the last few years been working to develop post-custodial strategic partnerships between the library and cultural memory institutions in broader Philadelphia. Um, and that was part of my work as the Bollinger Fellow in Public and Community Data Curation. So the intention behind this work um, was really kind of crafted and powered by Lori Allen. Um, and it was thinking about developing preservation capacity at both the institutional, the community and the personal levels. Um, and I think it's a strategy that really, um, I firmly believe has the potential to diversify the historical record um, and to encourage new avenues of research. Um, and so some of the hats I've worn in the past, I think that are kind of influencing my thinking on this subject is that um, I have in the past been a museum professional um, working as, as an assistant curator position um, in Florida. Before that, I was an overworked graduate student for many, many, many years, um, finishing my PhD. Um, and so it meant that for a very long time, I've had a long and sometimes very fraught relationship um, with the archive um, as a researcher, as a curator, as a librarian, um, and as a trained historian. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit about my academic background because I think it'll help frame um, my thinking on these subjects. Um, and so my academic work focuses on media and grassroots social movements in the Cold War Caribbean. Um, and because I've never wanted to stray too far from that, I wanted to start us off with a quote from Michelle Rook Trio, um, a famed anthropologist who says that the role of the historian is to reveal the past, to discover, or at least approximate the truth. And within that viewpoint, power is unproblematic irrelevant to the construction of the narrative as such. At best, history is a story about power. Um, and so in his work, Silencing the Past, Power and the Production of History, um, he analyzes how power operates in the making and recording of various histories. Um, he explores how certain narratives come to dominate the historical record um, and how others are left out or even worse, never recorded. Um, and I wanna, as an example, take the Haitian Revolution. Um, so in, 19, in 1791, enslaved African peoples in the French colony of Saint-Domingue began a rebellion, which over the course of 13 years, dismantled the interconnected systems of slavery, colonialism, racism, to establish the world's first black republic, Haiti. At the time, however, Transatlantic newspapers and journals largely misrepresented the slave rebellion, either as a minor occurrence or as the design of disgruntled white planters. French revolutionary leader Jacques Rousseau publicly chastised white colonial settlers for instigating enslaved peoples. His speech was widely picked up and circulated and reprinted, given by many um, their preferred explanation for the rebellion. So as these primary sources make their way into the archive, so too do the intrinsically racialized rationale that doubt the capacity of large-scale coordinated rebellion by enslaved peoples. 
Trudeau argues that the Haitian Revolution was unthinkable, even as it happened, because observers were unable to grasp the entirely new concepts of freedom and equality as they were espoused by enslaved Africans. So I think we therefore um, have to acknowledge the ways in which existing practices may produce this kind of one-sided historicity by creating powers that either silence um, in the making of the sources, silence in the creation of the archive, or a dearth of contextual information within the corpus of that archive. Um, and so I'm starting in 1791 um, because as a scholar of Haiti um, is relevant in my everyday, it always surprises me. Um, for instance, last summer, as protests spilled onto the street following the killing of George Floyd, a French intellectual writing for the magazine Jacobin evoked the French Revolution in ways that allowed France to appear firmly on the right side of history, in contrast, of course, to the US. His argument drew on an archive that cumulatively obscured some voices and narratives, in this case, those of Haitian revolutionaries, in favor of others. Um, and here, um, a friend and colleague of mine um, was very quick to correct him, which I think um, is the power of doing the kind of deep historical research um, in an arena that has little documentation. And so Kristen Keller reminds us precisely that, right? That archival practices such as provenance, order, custody, value, authenticity, and standardized systems of arrangement and description may fall, fail to serve the interests of disadvantaged individuals and communities. And here it's the difference I think between intent and impact. So I want us to kind of go through a little bit of a thought experiment here. So imagine doing research on climate gentrification in Little Haiti. Um, and for those who don't know, climate gentrification is a process by which entire neighborhoods are being forcibly displaced by wealthy developers who are purchasing land in South Florida that um, is about 10 feet above sea level. Um, and the reason that they're doing this is because there is going to be an anticipated six feet of sea level rise in the next 50 some odd years that will likely submerge Miami Beach, likely. It will absolutely submerge Miami Beach, um, meaning that the more inland parts of the city will be the new coastal regions. Um, so Little Haiti is one of the targets alongside Little Havana of climate gentrification. But imagine that you were a person who was doing that kind of research. And then imagine that you had to go through a slide, uh, an archival um, source like this to get to it. So say, for instance, you're doing research on COVID-related evictions, which I think um, we all will see is going to be the next kind of large-scale national um, crisis that we're facing, given the levels of homelessness that this will likely produce. Um, and in that research, stumbling upon something like the bum folder. And lastly, what if you were a young student of color doing research about African American life in your city um, and were made to flip through images like these as you clone as you comb through a quote black folder. So I think that we collectively talk a lot about representational gaps within archival records but fail to connect and redress the ways in which our own institutional practices facilitate both erasure and archival silence. How are our spaces contributing to these, silence, these silences? Ashley Farmer um, in 2018 
wrote an article about her experience at a predominantly white archive um, and describes her ongoing dis-ease despite years of training um, and a degree from Harvard um, about not only the lack of diverse holdings and resources, but the ways in which they continue to marginalize black scholars and their scholarship. And so here's her quote. Um, my, well, actually, um, so I think what's mis most disheartening about Dr. Farmer's experience is, is the way that it echoes those of John Hope Franklin some 70 years earlier. So he says, quote, my arrival created a panic and emergency among the administration that was itself an incident of historical proportions. The archivist frankly informed me that I was the first Negro who had sought to use the facilities there. And as the architect who had designed the building had not anticipated such a situation, my use of the manuscripts and other materials would have to be postponed for several days, during which, during which time one of the exhibit rooms would have to be concerted, converted into a reading room for me. So I wanna say, and just kind of point out the ways in which institutional archives can convey very powerful messages through unspoken, unwritten manifestations of their beings. Everything from the design of their buildings, from the behavior of their staff, from the demographics of their staff and the boards, from the choices they make in their collections, their programming and their exhibits. I think it's worth, it's worth noting, um, that community members and nonprofit organizations often have robust archival holdings that never find their way into large state and nationally recognized repositories. Um, individuals and institutions are always actively documenting social and political movements that have been ignored or importantly misrepresented by mainstream archival repositories. And so for the last five years or so, I've been involved in community archiving efforts that actively engage underdocumented and underrepresented communities in the process of digital archival creation and curation. Um, using the resources and expertise at my disposal, um, I try to support their ongoing work and to assist in facilitating both access and preservation. Um, so as John mentioned, I can talk, I think, about some of my earlier work that has to do with Haiti, that has to do with the preservation of radio archives um, in Haiti. But I think I'm gonna instead focus on Philadelphia, um, I, largely because I think it's close to home. And so as some of you may know, Philadelphia is the sixth largest metropolitan city in the US. Um, it has, as of these slides, um, 1.6 million um, people, 42.9 of which identify as Black, making Philadelphia uniquely a minority majority city. What was really striking to me when I first moved here was finding out that Philadelphia was experiencing rates of gentrification that surpassed kind of poster children for that kind of demographic shift, like San Francisco, like Portland, like Seattle. Um, it turns out that it was fourth behind New York, Los Angeles, and Washington, DC. And these processes were displacing um, racial and socioeconomic um, communities within the city. And as a result, we're threatening existing social practices and places with deep historical and cultural significance to those marginalized communities. So the very physicality of the city had been changing around the community leaders and activists of color who were engaged in activities that were attempting to document the contemporary black experience in Philadelphia. And we're establishing a dialogue around the changing of the landscape. Um, in a social, political, and historical context. Um, and so these are just kind of some headlines that um, I pulled out from the last um, few years about the ways in which Philadelphia was changing. Um, one of these you might see 
was a school for sale. I think it was Germantown High School um, with a poster board in front of it that um, said quite literally schoolsales.com. That's how these things were being auctioned off. The other is West Philadelphia High School, which was built in the 19 teens. Um, and as of maybe seven or eight years ago, was sold and converted into luxury lofts. Um, I think you guys will remember the most recent selling of um, the hospital in Center City um, and the ways in which the language around that sale were really about gutting that institution to make way for something new. Um, and so a lot of artists, activists have been leading initiatives such as the Disappearing Blackness Project, the Middle Passage Project, that have sought to highlight the long legacy that has forced people of color, um, that forced movement of people of color. Um, and the ways in which these sites are significant to African-American culture in the city um, that has been particularly um, influenced or um, rather harmed by the shift. And so as communities of color are facing various forms of erasure, um, I think we, as part of well-resourced institutions, um, can support and amplify the visibility of these unique cultural heritages in ways that foreground social justice, that redefine um, between institutions, redefine the relationship between institutions and their neighbors, and that view successes as mutual growth and capacity to preserve historical materials within a decolonial framework. And so we know quite a lot about Ben Franklin's um, Philadelphia um, and considerably less about the Philadelphia of the 90s, of the 1980s and 90s. Um, and without intervention, the most recent Philadelphian past, particularly those of Black and Afro-diasporic, Latinx and migrant populations will be lost. Um, so at the Remember Black Philadelphia project, what we're really trying to do is construct an alternative archive that supports the production of these kinds of narratives. So remember Black Philadelphia is a lot of things, but in a nutshell, it's a multimodal digital scholarship and community archiving project that seeks to investigate the fraught past, present and future of Black Philadelphia um, and the increasingly endangered spaces in which social and cultural practices continue to happen against the backdrop of that displacement. So it's really grounded in a resource sharing model um, that is thinking about equitable access and it aims to combat cultural erasure, um, to foster intergenerational dialogue um, to use community-driven post-custodial archiving practices to build alternative historical records. And the goal is to make community material visible and legible and accessible. Um, and ultimately, for in future generations, to enable communities to create a kind of narrative making of their own. Um, so I'll go through some of the work that we've been doing um, and these in particular are the case studies mentioned um, in the title of this talk. Um, and so one of the projects that we've been working on has really been around the MOVE bombing, which um, for those who don't know, in um, 1985, um, the Philadelphia police um, alongside FBI dropped a bomb on a black radical um, organization, black power organization, um, not too far away from Penn in West Philadelphia, killing I think about 15 people, many of which were children. Um, and so one of the things that was always very striking to me about the MOVE bombing in particular is how little I knew about it until moving to Philadelphia. So how this particular moment in Philadelphia history and in the US history had not really been taught. And it turned out that I was not alone, that in fact, several other, if not many other people 
were similarly um, just unaware that this had happened in our backyard. Um, and so we've been thinking about and trying to do several things that'll document this particular moment in, um, in Philadelphia history. And part of the power of alternative archives is precisely that the only, not only, much of the existing record having to do with the move bombing comes from state um, sources. So it comes from congressional hearings, from police records, um, and not from the individuals that were a part of it, and not from Black Philadelphians who experienced it, I think many would say, as a very deep wound. Um, so I'm going to stop here and kind of, I think, hopefully share um, some of the work that we were doing around the Remember Black Philadelphia project. So one of the things that we did was collect oral histories from individuals who were there, who lived in Philadelphia at the time, who remembered the move bombing um, as a way to really humanize the experience of being a citizen, especially a black citizen in a city that had recently bombed its, its um, constituency. And so I, I hope that you guys can hear this. Please let me know if you cannot. Is that coming through? Okay. So at, the, at the top where your sharing controls are, there should be an option to enable computer share computer audio at your where your zoom controls are. I am not seeing them. I'm sorry. I think you have to get out of the share. And then when you're just about to share, that's where it is. <laughs> okay. All right. So stop sharing. Now just open the share before you pick the screen. There should be something at the bottom. Oh, okay. Perfect. Thank you. I remember my dad and my mom sitting around watching TV and my mother was, a, she was a military person. So she cursed all the time, but my dad never cursed. And my dad was cursing up a storm and I couldn't figure out why he was angry. And then as I'm watching everything happening, I'm asking who did that, who did that? And my child brain formulated that people in charge did that. People who in school we had taught, were taught would protect us, did that. And to this day, I'm a 40 year old woman now, to this day, it sticks with me that in a moment, my first experience with essentially a terrorist act was someone in charge doing it to someone who was not people we're supposed to trust. So I think that there's a particular power in being able to hear a version of the move bombing from the perspective of a citizen of Philadelphia, a black citizen of Philadelphia, who at eight years old experienced this moment in her city's history and at 40 could really remember where she was and how she felt and the wound that carries on. And so that is in large part, some of the work that we've been doing. Um, again, for those who are aware of kind of the West Philadelphia neighborhood, one of the impetuses to work with the MOVE organization um, in particular was the development in the area in which the MOVE bombing had happened. So up until a few years ago, um, that area was completely desolate, looking very much like the photo that you saw just a minute ago. And yet, as development starts moving further and further west, you could really see, and I think a lot of Philadelphians in particular, Crystal Strong, who's the lead on the Remember, Remember Black Philadelphia project, 
could really see a reality in which in 10 or 20 years, a space like this no longer exists. So what does it mean to capture this particular moment, to capture the space as, as it exists right now in 2018, as it has existed in some ways since 1985, to capture the voices of people um, who've had this experience and layer that on top of the existing archive. And so remember Black Philadelphia is doing this kind of multimodal work. And part of it is really thinking about finding ways to capture endangered spaces that really influence people's um, experiences but also that can do so in their own voices. So another thing that we've been doing um, is doing on-site data collection at important junctures um, to Black Philadelphians. We've crowdsourced events that are significant to the community in one way or another, areas that are significant to the community and have gone and just kind of like chatted with people, collected their memories, collected um, their experiences as a way to kind of nuance what we know about contemporary life in Philadelphia. One of those was at the Odun Day Festival and this is back in 2019, which is the largest African-American street festival in North America. Um, and in speaking to people, we learned, um, which I had not known at the time, that it has these really amazing and really authentic roots back to um, festivals that happen on the continent. Um, and this is from speaking to a sociologist who was based in Senegal, who just happened to stumble upon the festival in Philadelphia and was amazed by how, how closely aligned it was to uh, ones that he had been to um, back on the continent. Um, but in that conversation, what we learned also is that this particular event is, is in some ways under threat because again of gentrification. Um, and so I'm gonna play this video, which I hope will play. We've been coming to a doom day. My daughter is 40 some years old. Mm -hmm. uh, she was three or four. It was when it first started and um there was no one down here and she was little and she would run up and down the street that's how long i've been coming to a doom day i would say i've been coming about the last 25. the neighborhood has changed a lot the festival is pretty much the same each year you'll get a different a group of people they come from all over to help celebrate the uh, blessings of Oshun and celebrate the new year of a doom day which means happy new year and so yes uh, it's been regentified a lot, and um, I know over the years, past few years, they've been trying to uh, move Odun Day. People live in the community now, and they want to move Odun Day because it has been regentified with people of different color. Yes. Um, but we are determined to stay yeah, here. Uh, we determined. That's yes, right. yes. Um, so far, we're still standing. Yes. We just want to so be we give here. thanks. Yes. Yeah. yeah we just so. got to bring up our uh, younger generation to continue on the tradition. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really kind of interesting and important to capture these kinds of voices, um, to be in a space where you're documenting a present moment. Um, and I think it's also important that they're thinking about the nature of kind of intergenerational um, transmission of memory um, and how that work is really facilitated by having this kind of record. Um, We've been working, I think, to facilitate that kind of intergenerational bond that's really rooted in the way that we think about the project. Um, working with the Philadelphia School District on um, mapping events that allow students to spatialize their experience in Philadelphia, um, for which they were creating micro documentaries that will ultimately live on the site, right? But it allows them to think through what are the preconditions that really shape the lives that they do and can live in the city. Um, 
So showing them the ways in which transit and redlining maps have a everyday impact on the way that they experience the city um, and really asking them to think through what it means to be a young person um, in the city at this particular moment. But we're also connecting it back to older residents who are having kind of a similar conversation about where the city is moving, what the city was like when they were members um, of this kind of youth group. Right. Um, and so we've been working also with West Philadelphia High School Alumni Association. Um, and theirs is a particularly interesting case in large part um, because their records were lost in the move that we described earlier from an old building that's now condos to a new one. So working with them to kind of reconstruct their archives through data curation through kind of crowdsourced means, right, as a way to reunify um, records to approximate some kind of whole um, in terms of their kind of legacy planning. And they have this amazing event, which um, has alumni this 2019 um, that date back to alumni from the 1930s who show up each year for an event like this, right? So the ways in which this is a deeply rooted, deeply connected community and capturing their, me their memories really says a lot about how far the city has come and really speaks to a lot of different components about Philadelphia, about Philadelphia education, about um, kind of political and socioeconomic um, shifts that have happened. Um, and so lastly, I'll talk about um, the work that we've been doing um, kind of on the ground in these pop-up um, data curation events that are talking about preser preservation um, in large part to community members, offering them access to digitization equipment, um, to folders and sleeves to allow them to preserve their materials. Um, talking to them about their memories um, and seeking ways to proactively um, expand the life cycles of their items by talking to them about what it would look like to preserve them as best they can with the resources that they have currently available. Um, and so that has led to a digital archive um, of sorts that will broadly make that material accessible to community members themselves. Um, others, of course, but the the idea largely is to bring all of this material into a centralized space that allow us to start thinking about the city and documenting its change um, in a way that is reflective, I think, of the intent of its residents. Um, so that's all I have for you guys today. I realized that I probably ran a lot over in terms of time. Um, but I'm happy to, um, I think, stop here and answer questions, um, just chat, I guess. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jen. Wonderful. So much stuff to talk about. Um, so let me just remind everyone that um, we can um, take questions now. And so please take a minute to put some ideas together, uh, if you will. The easiest way to do that, if you'd like to speak your question, is to use the raise hand function that's in the reactions tab on your Zoom screen. If you prefer to put something in the chat, um, that's so that's good too, and I will try to follow that and um, and and relay those along to Jennifer. Um, in fact, Ellen shared the Remember Black Philadelphia website, so please take note of that. Um, and I can ask you. Okay, thank you. I was going to ask you what's its status, so you maybe could answer that so everybody knows, Jen. So we are. It's, its status is very interesting, um, in part because, as you might have guessed, a lot of our activities are very high touch. 
Um, and so COVID has really put a damper on our ability to be in the community to lead some of this um, on-site preservation work. Um, in fact, a, a sad reminder of exactly this, maybe the day or two before um, we really understood what was happening with the pandemic, I was in the basement of Mike Africa Jr. Um, who is um, a part of the MOVE organization reviewing records um, and going through boxes and boxes and bins of archival material that we were having a discussion about in terms of um, finding out ways to preserve it. Um, and so that kind of really in-person work is really hindered by, um, by our current um, constraints. That said, we're really thinking about we refocus to think about the website itself. So the version of the website that I see in the chat is an older version. And so we're doing the work of kind of revamping that um, right now. It's not yet live. It's really close. So I'm really excited about that. Um, and so we've been doing that and really thinking about what it looks like to re-engage as we hopefully emerge from this pandemic soon. Um, one of the difficulties, I think, is the fact that there is kind of um, an equity gap as it relates to technology and the communities that we're working with. So we don't want to move people um, in such a way that they either lose momentum, lose interest, or are in fact just can't be a part of the project any longer because we haven't considered fully what it means to, to integrate that kind of um, equitable approach into the way that we interact now, you know? Um, and so that's, that's where it is now. Um, but I'm, I'm hopeful that as things reopen, as we begin to engage um, soon, that we will be able to kind of regain some of that on-site momentum that we had back yeah. last year. Absolutely. Um, question from Devin, go ahead. Thank you for this. Uh, you know, I was just um, uh, struck by that last set of um, um, interviews about the, uh, the Odunde. And I was thinking about that particular area, you know, around Grace Ferry and that area where it's sort of the heart of that celebration. And there was a, a church there, uh, which, um, I'm, you know, the um, I think it was the uh, uh, it was a greater St. Matthew Baptist Church from the late 19th century that was that's now converted into uh, this kind of you know condominium complex called Sanctuary Lofts. And uh, I was just wondering if the project, in, you know, in addition to kind of the individuals, like the ways in which the institutions like that uh, and all the kind of reverberating effects that it has on the changing of, of the narratives and how all the narratives are connected with those are also, you know, to what extent they figure into your kind of um, data collection? Um, I think I think that they do. I'm always just entirely thrown by the egregiousness of some of these names um, <laughs> for, for condominium complexes. Um, but yeah, I think that we, because part of the work I think that we're doing is an intervention on places and spaces that are lost. There's so much that we won't be able to recover in this particular moment. Um, but I think through this kind of like broader um, process, there's some stuff that we'll be able to get a grasp on. There's some kind of feelings um, about spaces. I think working with communities allows things like the church that's now a condominium to, to have kind of annotation, right? You can have the space and then have people's memories layered on top of that space in a way that reclaims some of it. Um, I think that it's also really important. I think, especially now, and I think especially in light of COVID, one of the things that I was quite concerned about um, at the start of the pandemic was the ways in which lower, um, less re well-resourced institutions, especially cultural institutions, we're going to have a far more difficult time keeping their doors open 
So what does it look like to, I think in those cases, think about what support looks like, right? Like, I think that we're at this cusp where not only are we seeing kind of the gentrification of kind of cultural spaces that we, I think due to the pandemic, as I was talking about evictions, right? This like new kind of eviction crisis that we're likely to face, like we are potentially in a moment where in the next year or two, we're seeing a lot of our smaller cultural institutions um, disappear as, as well, right? Thinking about the work that's being done um, in regards, in support, I think, of um, the African-American um, Museum in Philadelphia, which back in early parts of the pandemic had had a significant more portion of their budget cut um, by the city. Like the city is experiencing a major budget fall right now. Um, and an institution like that, I think is, is way, it's just at the whims of that kind of like shift. Um, and so I'm not sure entirely if that answered your question as much as it made me think about the ways in which I'm just utterly concerned about where the records of this church went and if there was support for, for um, that kind of preservation. Maybe, it, maybe there wasn't, but also maybe folks were not aware that this was material that is broadly valued um, in a way that thinks about documenting space. That, that actually connects with two threads that are in the chat. So I'm going to try to put those together for you um, because one question from D. Andrews was about is about any work uh, that Remember Philadelphia has done with other, as she puts it, formal archives. So other collections in the city. Um, and a different question, but much really connected to what you were saying. You. You talked about people's memories layered on a space and and Deshen is asking if you could talk a little more about the tools and technology you use. Well, she's asking about when collecting data in the field, but obviously there's lots of technical stuff that we could talk about. So pick something. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, formal archives, technology. So in terms of smaller institutions, um, we've so we've worked largely with community-based institutions. Um, although I've been very eager, we've had short-term um, projects with organizations like Tayer, for instance, but that was that was my work, not necessarily remember Black Philadelphia's work, but I think it's in the same vein. Um, I was really excited about a project with um, the Black Writers Museum, um, which is up in Germantown, but again, um, COVID said no. Um, in large part, one of the, um, I think, major kind of all encompassing um, initiatives that I was a part of, and I think would have done some of the work of connecting cultural institutions in and around Philadelphia, was the work that I was doing with the Smithsonian um, Museum's Hometown Treasures Program, which was really thinking about um, increasing exposure um, supporting local preservation. Um, and that would have, again, been in the summer of 2020 and COVID said no. Um, and so I think that there are ways to bring folks together. I'm always a huge proponent of Paxgill actually being one of the sources that brings these smaller institutions together because so many things I think land on my desk or across my desktop um, that are really amazing um, and I think can be really supported by having a network where in smaller cultural heritage institutions and larger ones can proactively engage in kind of preservation. Um, but a lot, you know, I, there's, I think there's only so much I personally can do outside of, um, you know, forwarding things along and trying to connect people with resources that I know exist um, as I can. So I would I would love to see something um, more systematic in place um, in that regard. Um, in terms of uh, technologies, so we have been I don't 
we do a lot of high tech stuff with tools that are not necessarily all that high tech. Um, it took a little while to figure out how to properly anchor um, 360 cameras for the photography and the videography. Thankfully, we have um, a media director who is an expert in this kind of thing. Um, and alongside Dave Takafandi was able to get us kind of sorted out with our tech needs. Um, outside of that, we use just regular um, recorders. We try to um, kind of max out the kind of space that we work in so that we can get the best kind of audio um, that we can um, and have kind of pulled together different resources from similar initiatives online in terms of the kind of on-site um, archiving, digital archiving um, within a very kind of tight budget to like do whatever work we can, right? It's, it's in some ways, um, really kind of a shoestring operation in that regard that's really kind of anchored on people's interest um, on the existing expertise that we can leverage on the existing resources. Um, but again, I think it speaks to how much can be done um, with a bit more resources. Yeah, it's a different discussion, but I'd love to hear what, you know, if uh, the William Penn Foundation can, same to you, came to you and said, here's a lot of cash. What do you oh, know? That would be awesome. would, <laughs> know, maybe they should. Uh, Mitch, go ahead. Uh, hi, Jen. This is this is fantastic. It's great to have this in conversation with material text because I think it, they are really important together. So I was I was curious about your your thoughts, you know, ar archiving and archives are having sort of a cultural moment in in the word I think is in a lot of cultural discourses, it's out there, like you'll hear it more in the news than you've ever done before. And I was curious, as you work with uh, community groups, uh, your partners in these projects, what do people who don't come from the library archives formal world or the professoriate, like when they talk to you about family papers or when you were in Mike Africa Jr.'s basement, like what are you hearing people say about their ideas about archives and you know what they mean to them in terms of uh, you know family history, community history, you know what constitutes an archive to a lot of the people that you're talking with? I think um, that is a super interesting question. Um, and there are quite a few folks who are in this space who are trying to like map that out. Um, one of whom is Stephen Fullwood, who has the Nomadic Archives Project, which is really cool and is really thinking about ways to kind of like nuance and introduce some flexibility to the language of the archives as they exist, such that you open it up in ways that people start to recognize their own materials as archival and therefore in need of preservation in really significant ways. Um, the way that I tend to talk about it, um, I think is based on my own um, personal interests in other people's stories, right? Um, and so for me, I often approach it and just talk about the ways in which um, photo albums and photographs and community documents are of individuals and families and friends and partners, but they're also of communities and spaces and institutions, right? And so I think opening up that space so that there's this kind of dual understanding of the ways in which your christening photo is both your christening photo and also a record of what the religious institution that you attended in the 1980s in South Philadelphia, um, that those are one in the same thing, right? And I think that people are more inclined to think about institutional records as being worthy of um, kind of archival intervention and less so about um, their own materials. That said, in, the, in our engagements, and these were in, um, at the Blackwell branch in the Free Library, people were eager to have conversations about their materials, to learn about the proper way to store them, to have access to folders um, and boxes, um, to have access to scanners so that they knew at some point that there was a copy of it somewhere in case something happened, right? I think that um, 
I think that those things are, are, um, are happening kind of concurrently because people are aware that their materials are special, at least to them. Um, I think that they're less convinced that I'm that interested in their, in their like christening, you know, album. But I think that it's, it's important to, or for me, I found it very helpful to have the conversation that frames the story as both an individual story, but also a possible collective story. Yeah, that's great. It's just like the fostering an archival thinking process at all these different levels at the same time. Um, next question up is Laura. Hi, Laura. Hi. Um, yeah, thank you for this wonderful presentation. I was at Penn doing DH work for about five years and we overlapped by a few months, but I kind of wish we had connected more when we were both there together because this was a great presentation and, and such interesting work you're doing. Mean, I, I know um, I talked a lot with Lori about the work she did, and this seems like such a great way of extending that. Um, but my question was, because I'm coming from the point of view of somebody who's done, you know, familiar from the, you know, the curatorial and DH practical point of view, um, you know, I was thinking about how you're talking about, you, you know, you have these just undocumented, you know, just seemingly endless amounts of sort of undocumented cultural history in the city of Philadelphia and even like significant things. I also like you moved from another state to Philly and I could not believe I hadn't heard of the move bombing and like I still I've moved back to California and I'm like I mention it and people are like what? And I, like it's just amazing to me that nobody knows about this. Um, but I was thinking because it's so undocumented in a lot of ways, or there hasn't been the kind of archival work that you're trying to kind of instigate in a better way now, you're casting a very wide net. And so I was wondering, like from a curatorial point of view, I found it so interesting, like what you were just talking about with Mitch and what you mentioned in your presentation about just empowering community members, like let's just get as many people sticking things in folders and you know copying things and, and preserving. So you're just trying to get like stuff preserved and copied and have records of this. And then you're also trying to do these kinds of high end or you know more sophisticated websites and um, you know um, documenting audio um, oral history and all of that. So I wondered like how you're thinking in terms of from a kind of curatorial standpoint in terms of like um, how you're balancing those two things. And I'm imagining <laughs> some days you're thinking, you know, it feels like you're not, but like when you're thinking about it, how you're thinking about like, well, we're trying to just like get things documented. And then we're also trying to have these very formal records. And then, I mean, I know I'm not trying to put you on the spot in terms of like, you should have a plan because nobody has a plan for this, but I was interested in how you're thinking about since you are documenting these oral histories and things. Um, like if there's techniques you're thinking about in terms of digital preservation and like long-term preservation for the, you know, the digital materials, the videos and, and the audio and things that you're collecting. Um, Cause I think that's an open question for archives everywhere. And um, with this material that you're collecting right now in these moments that as you say, are gonna disappear soon, it's getting, you know, more and more essential that we can preserve these kinds of things. So I just wondered about your thoughts or like John was saying, your wish list if someone came to you and said, like, this is what you could do to preserve these things, what, what kinds of things you would wanna do. Um, yeah, so underlying all of this work, particularly the work at the, um, the free library, is a workflow. So we're developing a workflow that incorporates metadata description that uses open source technologies, um, particularly Google Docs and Google Sheets, um, and then has a minimal computing um, backend that allows one to generate these kinds of lightweight um, digital infrastructure, right? So part of the work that we're, we're doing and part of the work that I had been doing alongside um, some, of the, some of my colleagues at Penn is really trying to find ways to refine that process in a way that could hand over um, this kind of lightweight workflow to smaller organizations that will facilitate them um, in terms of creating metadata, cataloging um, their materials and creating digital surrogates that have space um, on um, something like a wax site. Um, and so the work that we're doing, um, it's like, 
there, I, I have, I think of things often as being just one huge thing. <laughs> so like rather than it being like a ton of tiny projects, um, a lot of what we're doing is, is trying to build out a kind of infrastructure that can support communities in doing this work. Um, one of the projects that I had not mentioned, but that I am working on is kind of a cost tiered um, preservation guideline alongside um, the folks at the Library of Congress's um, research and preservation department um, to find ways for folks to make slight interventions where possible of their own archival material. So, you know, if it's better that it's on a higher floor than a lower floor, that's great. But if we can put it in a um, an airtight box with cotton balls to absorb like um, moisture, that's even better, right? But we know that, um, and the folks at the Library of Congress know that as a form of intervention. But if you say to folks that it's going to take, you know, four hundred dollars to remediate an image, then we, you don't get to the part, you don't get to the point where 10 years down the road, you can make that intervention, you can digitize that image, right? So like trying to democratize the ways and kind of this, the tools that are currently used to make even um, small um, improvements in kind of the um, status of the material itself. Um, yeah, so that's, um, that's some of the work that's like happening behind the scenes and is being kind of refined by these engagements as we see how well the workflow works itself, how, what the learning curve for something like that is. Um, so that was um, part of the thinking as well. It's a great mission. It looks like you're doing fantastic work so far. So keep it up, Fiona. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, next up is Lynn, I think. Go ahead, Lynn. Hi, thank you so much, Jennifer. This is just so fascinating and I really wanna learn a lot more about what you're doing over time. One of the things that I got thinking about is, I mean, part of what we've often done institutionally is take in records of institutions that go out of business. And then they're like, what do we do with our material? And, and trying to think about that because so many, there's a life cycle to some of these organizations and institutions and they don't necessarily last forever. So trying to figure out, you know, how do you preserve that, that history right there that's within the organizations that may be taking in some of the materials that you are working to preserve because of the fact that sometimes they just go out of, go out of business. And, uh, you know, thinking about that, I know, you know, there's just, we, we're always getting queries about this kind of thing. Oh, we're, we're stopping and, you know, we need to find a place to put our archive and that archive may have a lot of different components to it. And I just wondering, thinking about that, it, I don't expect you to have the answer, but I just, it's one of the things I've been thinking about a lot recently. Yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't have an answer, but it's something that I'm like, I think about and, am actively concerned about as well. Um, I think I got here before um, the History Museum closed. Um, and shortly after I got here, there was a lot of conversation about a smaller museum, the Lest We Forget Slavery Museum, which was a kind of mom and pop family operation who had- Still exists, still exists in Germantown. It still exists, but part of that is like total intervention, right? That That's they right. needed space, they needed support. Um, and I think it's, I think it's like they're inside of the Germantown Historical Society building, are. right? That's so the ways in which these kind of smaller institutions were able to kind of leverage what they had access to, to provide support. Um, and that's really wonderful, but also not sustainable in any kind of like substantial way. Um, it's an interesting question because I mean, we have this conversation in large part with some of the partners that we work with, um, in part because there's always this impetus and a recognition that the kind of um, long-term preservation that we're talking about is really expensive and like 
the folks best positioned to do it are large institutions, right? But part of the reasons that that is more fraught is because oftentimes those large institutions don't have the kind of relationship that the Germantown Historical Society might have with the folks over at the Lest We Forget Slavery Museum, right? So like what work needs to be done between now and whenever to try to create those kinds of connections um, and create that kind of bond and that kind of trust is, um, I don't know, it's, it's, it's something that I think a lot about. Um, how do you, and how do you do it? So it's not always at the moment of crisis and closure, right? It's like the archiving instinct, not, not being in like, oh, we have a week left. What, but yeah. uh, I'm sorry, I was just gonna say, but also because even large institutions can't do it all. And so, I mean, we can't take in everything, you know, that places might want us to take, you know, take. So, I mean, we, you know, how do we, how do we work it as a culture? I mean, it's a larger community issues about how these archives, you know, end up not just in a single institution, which can't, you know, even if you've got a lot of resources, you don't have enough for everything. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's a super, it's, it's a really tough, it's a really tough, tough question. Um, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Thank you. Sarah, go ahead. Hi. Yeah. Thanks so much, uh, Jennifer, for this really awesome talk and for, for um, this um, project, which I think is great. Um, so this is actually sort of follows up on something that I think came up in the discussion just now and that I'm thinking about particularly perhaps from the frame of the Chronicling Resistance Project and the way in which um, there are collections not only at smaller institutions, but sort of outside institutions, right? Like in people's basements, as you were describing, and things like that. And that often people are distrustful of institutions, often for really good reasons, right? And so thinking about the ways in which, um, you know, our sort of default um, is often to think that this, if, if something is important, it should be in an institution, but that the people who have these really important collections don't necessarily want them to go to institutions, right? Or don't trust the institutions to do the right things with them. And so I'm wondering what thoughts you might have on this sort of really fraught question. I think we got into some of them, but if there's anything that you wanna expand on, I would love to hear it. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think it goes back to the question about creating ties and developing kind of trusted relationships that are based on proven action and intention, right? So like perhaps that, and I think, I think that the way that I've been thinking has always been such that, that there's an intermediary step between the thing existing in the community with no ties to archives and existing in the archive, right? That there, I think that there can be work that's like leveraged between those two steps to support the preservation and access to develop, to rec recognize that there are these limitations in terms of power, but that some institutions have more resources than others and can support um, in some way these materials toward kind of a shared like access point for like future um, preservation. Um, and so I think that, um, so my thinking is along those lines because I think yeah, I, it's going to be hard, I think, to go from one endpoint to another and not feel like that in, in interaction is extractive. Um, and that is, I think, a concern, right? Um, so, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's tough. And I think that that happens. Um, I was most recently in a conversation, I cannot even remember what of, but it was talking about the ways in which um, for the purpose of like collaborative grants, for instance, um, that that kind of extract, like some communities, oh, this, yes, this was particularly about Native American communities and, um, and the ways in which folks will approach communities with this amazing, amazing project that's gonna do X, Y, and Z. 
having not realized that those folks have been approached dozens of times before, have previously engaged in these projects um, and have either been left kind of out of the decision making, have those, you know, those projects have ended and the support for those projects have um, dissipated, right? So the ways in which we need to be kind of mindful of kind of our prior history of engagement um, as we're doing the work um, as well, I think is important. And that might be an aside, but I threw it in. No, there. I was actually gonna, I was actually gonna follow <laughs> up with a question about uh, and introduce the indigenous archives comparison, maybe. So I think, I mean, you know, just, just to play the literary side for a minute, you know, you, you use the word capture. And of course, our language uses this word capture all the time, capturing people's experience, you know, video capture. And, and I, I wondered if you could say a little more about, about this um, ethic in terms of, well, either in terms of, you know, what, what your object of study is um, or how you perceive it. Um, and maybe on the issue of what's, what's, what's being given and um, to you, to the, to the collective. Um, and even about this question that comes up in indigenous archives of, of what's going to be made public later and what might not, and, and who is that public, and and, uh, and what might not be. I don't know if those questions have come up in, in institutionally. I'm sure they have, and hard to resolve. But you know, there that you know, what's what's being given and what's being taken, as I guess. Yeah, um, I'll say this: that the question about who the audience is, what the materials are, and what's public frequently comes up. Um, I'll say this about. And I've also been thinking about the language um, that I use in part because someone said something to me about the word leverage recently. And I was like, oh, wait, that's not good. Um, and so there's, all, there's always a process of refinement, I think, um, and kind of being trying to be reflective of the ways in which my own positionality is influencing the work. Um, in a way that I don't recognize, but it has influence um, either way. Um, but what we try to do, so there's a couple of things about this project in particular that, um, and the way that we position and kind of posture the project that help us to think through some of the questions that you asked. One, um, is that the project lead is a woman um, named Crystal Strong, who's a professor in the Graduate School of Education. And she is a native Philadelphian through and through. And this project is for her um, uh, uh, an, in, an inspirational project in, of sorts, right? That they're from the offset is not, um, it's, it's a labor of love <laughs> that she is engaging in this project. Um, and so I think that that approach and having that approach be at the head of the thinking for the project is really helpful. Um, in terms of the language of capture, um, I'll, I'll go back. It's really helpful in part because as we're thinking about the project and as we're thinking about who the audience for the project is and how we understand access and um, open access in particular and discoverability that we're constantly asking folks and rechecking and checking in with folks and giving them an, an opportunity to either appear or not appear to appear um, internally versus not um, we're investigating the use of a tool called Mukurtu which allows kind of these um, tiers of access um, in part because we recognize that while some people are so totally on board and really love what the work is doing, might not want their materials to be kind of just on the internet as it exists, right? Um, and so we are thinking very seriously and like looking into ways to allow people to participate without having to feel as though 
they are made more vulnerable as a result, right? Um, this work is particularly poignant because we are trying to think about and trying to document kind of the Black resistance movements that have been happening over the summer um, and want to be re -care really careful that we are not um, putting anyone in harm's way by collecting this material, even though we fully recognize its importance. Um, so there's that. Um, the other, the question about um, language and capture, uh, and in particular leverage, one of the things that I think is really important to, to recognize is that there's always gonna be kind of this asymmetry of power in working with folks. Um, and that's just by virtue of Penn being in the position that it is in Philadelphia itself. Um, and so one of the ways that we try to think about that is to be as honest and upfront about that as possible um, and to integrate things in our practice that try to actively remediate some of that <laughs> um, in some ways. I think this is where kind of the resource sharing kind of becomes a really important part of the project because it recognizes that we have access to expertise that um, other folks might not, right? So by, by the nature of the fact that I am a staff member um, at Penn Libraries, that Crystal is a professor at Penn Libraries, um, that we can, I think, use the positions that we're in to support, I think is, is really important. Um, and so I think that's what I'll, I'll say about that. Although I will say that um, I'm now wishing I had not said capture. <laughs> um, no, I, just, I just think it's, it's, a, it's not you, it's not you didn't say it, it's a word in our- Yeah, in, in our, no, it's hard our... to think about what the language is, right? Because like I said, the other day I was talking to somebody and they were like, well, leverage, you know, they were talking about their own experience. Um, getting called out for using the word leverage. And I was like, oh crap, I use that word all the time. Um, so like, I maybe need to think about like how I'm using it, right? So, but I think that that's a process of like, um, trying, to, trying to be aware and trying to refine and recognizing that, you know, intent is very different from impact across the board. So doing whatever you can do to, to minimize impact, negative impact. Yeah. No, that's fantastic. Um, I don't see any hands up. Um, we have a minute or two left if someone would like to, to get in for a question. I'll just summarize briefly. There's a, we've got some good tips from our conservation colleagues about reducing humidity. So check those out in the chat. Um, and um, some references from Eleanor Shevlin to um, Ellen Powell Turbini T. Barino's sculpture on the move bombing and who was uh, from the family lived in Powelton um, and also to one of the great Philadelphia novels which is John Edgar Wideman's Philadelphia Fire. Um, which I can recommend as well as others here. Um, the Tiberinos, Ellen, um, her family, they were sharecroppers and she came here right before she was born. So she was a native Philadelphian and she lived, um, you know, I don't know, when you were talking about family archives and do people realize and, um, you know, they, you probably know uh, you know, they were two artists in Philadelphia, Joe and um, Ellen, and uh, they had a family museum. Some of their works have been in the Philadelphia Art Museum, I don't know, but she got a lot, there was a lot of controversy, if, if you know that sculpture, that was kind of interesting because she, she depicted the people burning with Wilson Good looking on in the sculpture and Good's daughter was at law school at the temple. I, I remember that getting a lot of national attention too. And that's why, you know, at the time, but a lot of things do and then they pass and you don't remember them. But, um, I, you know, anyway, um, I don't know if they, I don't know their, I don't know if their children have kept their things. <laughs> 
but they had two houses and you might know them. I mean, you might know of the source because they looked at it as a kind of a, um, and they were kind of a cultural mecca here and they had those ties specifically. They weren't involved in move at all. They were artists and they were commenting on it. Thank you so much for this. I had not heard of, of this, but um, I will definitely look into it and share it with um, our team because I think this is really, really interesting and really important. Well, if there are no more questions, I, I think we can say that even just based on that last conversation, the, the more we talk, the more doors that open um and doors within doors and communities uh, and within communities so um, i hope this is a conversation we can all continue i think it raises some really profound questions for this in the institution of penn our institutions and our places and everybody uh, in our world so i think we can all thank jennifer for a spectacular talk and to be continued. We look forward to hearing more about the project. Thank awesome. you, Jen. Thank you guys so much for, for having me this evening.